Hello and welcome again to my Physical Science Online Lectures series. Today I want to talk about uh, the third topic that goes in this online course, the third set of lectures, which is about force and motion. And just give a little bit of an introductory overview of forces, motion, anything like that. <clears throat> so in the previous set of lectures we talked about motion uh, in, in terms of kinematics, that is the general description of motion. And um, you could really think of it as um, we've described what, what motion might look like or what form it may take. Um, now we're getting into sort of the cause and effect between force and motion. Uh, mostly forces being sort of a, a substitute efficient cause uh, for motion. And uh, the specific uh, the specific set of laws that we're interested in are Newton's laws, uh, specifically Newton's three laws of force and motion. And um, maybe then later we can talk about some specific forces uh, like friction or, or the buoyant force or uh, gravity. And then from there uh, in, in the lecture, move on to momentum and angular momentum and um, torque, which are uh, at least uh, torque is sort of a rotational equivalent to force and then momentum and angular momentum and their conservation, uh, specifically their conservation, is a consequence of Newton's laws. So uh, to give the, this general overview though, uh, Newton's laws of uh, motion are three in number, and they were basically discovered in order from first law to third law. And uh, beginning with the first law was actually discovered well before the time of Newton in the uh, high Middle Ages. Uh, the, the first person that we've found uh, recorded uh, writing down something like Newton's first law is actually Jean Biredon, who was a theologian and natural philosopher at the uh, Catholic University, uh, University at Paris, and uh, he was basically working around the mid 14th century, so kind of towards the end of the Middle Ages, uh, maybe a hundred years or so after that university held the famous uh, uh, scholar St. Thomas Aquinas uh, and, and sort of all the controversies that that he helped to resolve and sort of the controversies that came after him. So it's, it's always been kind of an interesting university and atmosphere that, that, that had been held, uh, housed there in the Middle Ages. Um, in any case, uh, what Jean Buridan basically said was that the uh, planets were given some amount of motion at the beginning of, of time um, and they've retained that motion to his day, uh, more or less unchanged. At least uh, they sort of make these orbits that are um, with a quantity of motion, uh, which we ultimately might call momentum, uh, which is unchanged because they're moving through a region, a space in which there's no friction or other forces uh, to act on them. Now uh, bear in mind that this was um, well before the time of Newton and in fact before the time of Galileo and Kepler and um, so on. So they didn't really necessarily have any kind of law of gravity. They didn't necessarily know that the planets don't really move in a circular orbit with constant speed, that they actually are moving along a uh, elliptical orbit uh, in which the speed changes, although the angular momentum is not changing. And um, 
So that, that ultimately ended up becoming Newton's first law, uh, which might be formulated by saying simply <coughs> that um, if, if uh, there's no net force acting on an object, then the object will not experience any acceleration. That's the simple form of it. In other words, uh, if an object is already in motion, then it's going to tend to stay in motion and with a constant velocity unless some net external force acts on it to change that velocity. And uh, if the object is at rest, then it will stay at rest until some net external force acts on it to get it to start accelerating. So that's Newton's first law. Uh, briefly summarize this. The second law uh, actually also was formulated before Newton's time uh, by a uh, contemporary actually of Galileo, so maybe one generation of scientists before Newton, uh, if you generate, if you measure the generations by sort of how science was developing in, in, in uh, physics and astronomy at the time. And, and this contemporary's name was Rene Descartes, um, He's also a very well-known philosopher. He's the guy for whom the Cartesian coordinate system is named. Um, uh, Descartes or Cartesian, uh, same, same basic term there. That's the rectangular coordinates, if you will, x, y, z. And, and he actually, uh, that we know of, was the first to formulate Newton's second law. And uh, what Newton's second law ultimately says is that if there is a net external force acting on an object, then you can get the object's acceleration if you know what the object's mass is and you know what the force is. Basically, it's the F equals MA law. Um, so net force as a vector is equal to the object's mass times its acceleration, where the acceleration is a vector. And um, then the third law was the one that was actually written out by Newton, and what Newton did from there was he wrote that third law, and then he put the, the three laws together and sort of explained what their significance was, and, and, and so they are Newton's laws of motion. Uh, the third law basically says that if you have one object applying a force on the second object, then that second object is applying the same uh, magnitude, opposite direction of force back on the first. So, for example, I'm going to point this over at the wall. If I put my hand on the wall and start pushing against the wall, I'm applying some force that way into the wall. The wall actually is applying the same amount of force, but back towards me on my hand. So, same force, opposite direction. Sometimes it's, this is the called the action and reaction law. So for every action there is an opposite but equal reaction. It's really for every force um, there is a uh, reacting force that is applied at the same time uh, on the object that applies the acting force. There's a reacting force and that the, the opposite part is that they're in opposite directions. Um, equal part is that they have equal magnitude. So if I push with 100 newtons on the wall, the wall pushes with 100 newtons on me. And it's actually important there to, to distinguish between the force that I'm applying to the wall and the force that the wall is applying to me and distinguish what is having a force applied on it. So I'm applying 100 newtons to this wall. Um, the wall is applying 100 newtons back on me. Those two forces don't actually cancel because they're on different objects. Um, so before moving on to uh, some consequences of this, it's worth noting that forces are vector quantities. So they have a magnitude and a direction. Um, hence, the, if you know the magnitude and direction of the force, you can get the magnitude and direction of the acceleration. So if I am pushing on the wall, I can apply some force of 100 newtons on the wall and that force is basically to my left. So the wall is then applying 100 newtons right back on my hand, but to my right. <clears throat> so it, um, when adding forces together, 
you take the forces that are acting on a single object and you add them together. So in this case, uh, I push on the wall, the wall pushes back on me. The forces that are actually acting on me are the force from the wall pushing on me, but also the force of friction, which is pushing against the force from the wall. So the wall is pushing this way, friction maybe is pushing back this way, and that's why I'm not actually moving when I apply this uh, force. I don't start accelerating um, uh, to my right. Um, so that, that brings up a few uh, specific forces. Um, Friction, of course, is one of them. There's two types. There's a static friction, which is what's keeping me from really sliding off that way when I push on the wall, and, and specifically when the wall pushes back on me. There's kinetic friction, which would slow me down if I actually was already in motion. That's why things can slide or roll to a stop. Uh, there's gravity, which is actually pulling downward on me. Um, the, the way that you find gravity is if you're sitting on the surface of the earth you take the object's mass in kilograms and you multiply it by 9.8 meters per second squared that's the gravitational acceleration so mass times g gives you weight in newtons a useful approximation is that uh, 100 grams of mass is approximately equal to one newton of weight when you're on the earth um, it's, it's actually equal to 0.98 newtons. Um, since gravity is pulling downward on me and I'm not actually falling down, that actually <coughs> excuse me, that implies that there is an upward force that's holding me in place. That is the normal force. Um, and then uh, if I were to jump into a, a tank of water or in fact, because there's a different fluid called the air that surrounds me, there's another force called buoyancy that's pushing upwards on me. Um, and uh, last but not least, I, I wanted to quickly note one um, important consequence of Newton's laws, uh, which is that uh, if you take the th his three laws together, you get what's called momentum conservation. Momentum conservation means that if my momentum changes via, for example, a collision or because I'm pushing off of somebody, etc., then I should also be imparting some momentum or stealing some momentum from the object that I'm interacting with. So um, that's sort of a, a consequence of all three laws together, but in particular of Newton's third law. Because if I apply some force, maybe the, I'm standing on ice or something and I have a friend and we push off of each other, we apply the same force to each other. That force, according to Newton's second law, should give us the same uh, uh, mass times acceleration. Well, acceleration is change in velocity per unit time, so we have the same change in mass times velocity per unit time, which is the same change in momentum per unit time. And this happens over the same amount of time because as long as I'm pushing on my friend, my friend's pushing back on me with the same force. It's in opposite directions. That means that we're going to each get a change in momentum and my friend's change in momentum in that direction is equal in magnitude to my change in momentum in this direction. So the total momentum of my friend and I has to be conserved. Um, and that's that's uh, simple momentum. Uh, again, that's a vector quantity. There's also angular momentum, which is as well a vector quantity, and that is also a conserved term. And we change that by torques rather than by forces. So I think that that's a um, good, although fast, introduction to uh, the topic of force and motion. I hope you enjoyed this video, and uh, uh, thanks for watching.